During a brief inspection of 6 P2B motherboards from ASUS in the first video of this series, board number 5 stood out as the most promising candidate for repair. Notably, the ASUS hardware monitoring IC and ISA slots show no signs of corrosion, and the board's back is immaculate. The spotless serial and parallel ports are the icing on the cake. However, a few traces on the front of the board have corroded. Some are just beginning to show signs, while others have already dissolved entirely. Given that there is not much new to see and I have demonstrated trace repairs in previous videos, we will cover some other topics today. The primary focus of today's video will be on answering the question of whether it is necessary to replace capacitors of vintage hardware, like this motherboard, which is over 25 years old by now. You may have heard that it is an absolute necessity to replace old capacitors, even though there is no sign of leakage or swelling. Considering that all my P2Bs appear to be functioning well without recapping, I am inclined to question the necessity of hastily replacing electrolytic capacitors on vintage hardware. Of course, there are cases where a recap is indeed necessary. Take for instance this ASUS P4B released during the capacitor plague which was in full swing from 1999 to 2007. Boards released during this time should be checked thoroughly, and preventive recapping may not be such a bad idea, even though there is no visible damage around the capacitors. Electrolytic capacitors can degrade internally, leading to increased internal resistance or high leakage current, hindering their intended functionality. So, I wondered whether we could detect a variance in power consumption or observe a decline in temperature of the voltage regulators after a recap. But more about this later, because I stumbled upon something else while inspecting the expansion slots. One of the connection pins inside the HEP slot is dislodged from its socket and badly deformed. I have never seen something like this and I have no idea how this could have happened. Hopefully, we don't have to replace the entire slot. But before we try to fix the HEP slot, a quick word from PCBWay, the sponsor of today's video. Are you looking to bring your electronic projects to life? Then PCBWay is your one-stop destination for all things PCB manufacturing and assembly. Are you in need of fancy looking PCBs with full color graphics and designs? Then PCBWay has got you covered with their full color UV printing technology. Are you uncomfortable using a soldering iron or does your project require hundreds of SMD components to be soldered? Then PCBWay has got you covered with their comprehensive assembly services. And if you like to compete with other enthusiasts, then you should check out the KeyCAD design contest hosted by PCBWay. You still have until the 2nd of June to submit your project. Visit PCBWay.com to get more information and explore their other services. Links are in the video description. So, back to our damaged HEP slot. I want to avoid to replace it, but I have never attempted to repair an expansion slot in such condition. The best idea I could come up with was to try various tweezers and carefully bend the pin back into its original position. But that is easier said than done. First, the pin needs to go back into the plastic socket it snapped out from. And second, the metal proved to be far sturdier than I had presumed. Of course, those pins must withstand countless insertions of expansion cards. Therefore, it is reasonable that they are designed to resist deformation. Nevertheless, this one is mangled. Fortunately, the pin is situated at the end of the row, which somewhat simplifies the task. I'm surprised too. It is hard to believe that I could fix this AGP slot. Yet, here it is, flexing all its 132 pins once more. Before powering on the board however, I double and triple checked the AGP slot. With an inserted graphics card, I tested the contacts around the fixed pin with a multimeter to be sure there were no surprises with bridged or shorted signals. But everything checks out. In the meantime, I also addressed the corroded traces on the board, reinforced them with copper wires where necessary and applied a layer of yellow solder mask. 
We are all set to put this board to the test. For our experiment involving the replacement of all electrolytic capacitors, I've chosen to use this Pentium 3 600. Not only is it the fastest cut my CPU available, it also has the highest TDP rating of 34.5 watts among all Pentium 3 CPUs. I am hopeful that with a higher TDP rating, we will observe a more significant difference once we replace the capacitors. While early Pentium 2 models, particularly the 300MHz Klamath processor with a core voltage of 2.8V would have been a better choice because it has a TDP rating of 43 watts, I miss this model in my collection. And that is why we are limited to this Pentium 3 with a core voltage of 2.05V. And of course, the first attempt failed. That seems to be mandatory with my boards and happened to each of my boards so far. But I'm sure the board is alright. All we need is a bit of contact cleaner to make it post. And board number 5 boots. We're at 5 working motherboards. And just one more to go. Lucky me that I didn't have to replace that AGP slot. Of course, before we start testing we need to flash the BIOS, so the board detects the Pentium 3 and we get rid of the warning from the hardware monitor. Now let's run some benchmarks and games to gather data before we replace the caps. A power meter connected to the wall outlet will display the current power consumption of the entire system. I will also measure the temperatures of the voltage regulators right next to the CPU socket, using my Infrared T2S Plus thermal camera. R1 and R2 measure two MOSFETs used to power the Pentium 3. R3 is the power control chip we have replaced on board number 3 with a version capable of regulating the CPU core voltage down to 1.3V. Today's board still has the original chip, limiting the core voltage to a minimum of 1.8V. That is ok for the Pentium 3 we will use in the upcoming benchmarks, but not good enough for copper mine CPUs. Three, two, one, go! I believe the best benchmark to measure any difference after the cap replacement is the original Unreal rendered in software mode. I will focus on this benchmark after we replace all capacitors. Throughout the tests we could observe spikes up to 74 watts on the power meter. Most of the time however we hover between 60 and 70 watts while utilizing the Radeon 9000 and the Pentium 3. That should give us a good baseline. The thermal camera provides us with insights into the temperatures. Both MOSFETs and the power control chip hover between 45 and 55 degrees. There is also an inductor which seems to be a few degrees warmer than the ICs. I would not have expected this. It's just a copper wire around an iron core. Well, I learned something today. And I know that this inductor affected the temperature measurement of one of the MOSFETs. Anyway, let's remove the capacitors now. My favorite method to remove electrolytic capacitors is to wiggle them slowly out of their position, alternating between the two leads with a soldering iron. This board has a large ground plane around some of the capacitors. Heating this area using hot air would be challenging due to the copper plane acting as a heatsink. Furthermore, I believe that heating the leads only causes a lot less stress to the board. It is my preferred method to remove capacitors. It's fast, doesn't require another tool and is gentler to the board.
After removing the old capacitors, we must prepare the board for the new caps by freeing the holes from the solder residue. I apply low melt solder and let it mix with the existing solder, but only two holes not part of the larger ground planes. That is because even with low melt solder, clearing holes connected to large copper planes is very challenging unless you're using a lot of heat. A wick in combination with low melt solder and flux works quite well on the other holes though. And here is a P2B with all capacitors removed, all 24 of them. Most have a capacitance of 1000 microfarad and are rated for 6.3 volts. I'm sure you're curious to know what their condition is. After all, they have been residing on this board for over 25 years. And I cannot believe those results. Less than half an ohm in ESR and a VLOS below 3%. The smaller caps have a capacitance about 10% lower than written on the housing, but the taller ones all report over 1000 microfarad, have an even lower ESR value and a VLOS of around 1.5% or less. Those capacitors seem to be in excellent condition. Now I feel like this was a total waste of time and I'm afraid that a new set of capacitors will not make a significant difference. Talking about high quality components on genuine ASUS boards. If this isn't proof that those boards are genuine, then I don't know what is. While we have the board already without caps, I decided to upgrade its power control chip. This new chip will make the board copper mine compatible. Furthermore, I reflowed the solder around the NEC MOSFET, the one that was loose on two of my other boards, as a preventive measure. Now all we need to do is to fill the empty spots with 24 new capacitors. But we still have some holes blocked by solder. A soldering iron should be able to quickly melt the solder even though a large copper plane is attached. Once the solder liquefies, we can push the second leg through the hole and solder the capacitor to the board. I will continue to do this for all caps connected to the ground plane. And the board is recapped. Let's see if we can measure any significant difference with the new caps.
And as expected, there is nothing to see here. We get the same reading from the power outlet as we did with the previous caps. The temperatures are also very similar. What a waste of time. So, what do you think about this project? Would you have expected those caps to be in such good condition? Rubicon and Sanyo. Probably one of the last batches before the capacitor plague destroyed the reputation of many manufacturers of electrolytic capacitors for many years. None of those boards will require a recap. At least not for a couple of years. But maybe even decades. But we are far from done. There are still a few more secrets to uncover. Today, however, we have reached the end of this episode. Let me know in the comments if you were surprised by the condition of those caps. Would you still feel better with a recapped board? I'm looking forward to reading your comments. And now I want to thank all my Patreons for their invaluable support. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.